storyteller, a voice actor, a dungeon master, and the keeper of Critical Role, Matthew Mercer! This is crazy. I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't know what to expect coming in here. I didn't realize it was going to be a, a wraparound room. This is. I. I feel like I'm unable to escape now, which was part of the plan, right? <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Matthew Mercer. I am a voice actor from Los Angeles, California. Uh, I've done voices in many, many games and cartoons for the years, and. Uh, found myself blending my passion of games and voices with my love of tabletop games by bringing in some of my doofus friends together and streaming it online in a show called Critical Role. Um, and that's been crazy. <laughs> Continuously. Uh, yeah, wow, there's a lot of people. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, it's still surreal. Um, we, we started streaming for the heck of it. We were asked to try it out and we didn't think it would find an audience. We were like, well, we'll, 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 we'll hopefully maybe some people will care. It's very long. <laughs> the, all of internet media, and like, which is what we, a lot of us came from, doing like web series and projects like that, and they're all like, if it's longer than five minutes, no one will ever care. <laughs> they were wrong. Um, but yeah, so uh, we've been doing it now for four years, coming up on five, <laughs> which is crazy. It, it doesn't feel like it, but it, but five, almost five years of streaming are, are a ridiculous little game, and it's been amazing. Um, we've met so many incredible people. We've had the opportunity to bring in some amazing guests. Now we have our own Twitch channel and our own studio, in which Marisha is the creative director and is an absolute badass. Um, we joked for years, wouldn't it be great to do an animated series? <laughs> and we pitched it around to a bunch of studios and they all went, nah. What is that, your D&D game? No one will watch that. <laughs> I'm seeing a pattern emerge. Uh, and so we kickstarted it and thanks to you guys and, and all your amazing support, we are, I think, still the fifth highest Kickstarter in history. And uh, literally got on the flight to this convention from our offices, finishing the last day of our story summit on the, the, uh, the animated series with our writer's room and super excited about that and to show you guys as it progresses. It's been so crazy to be, be in a room of like really talented professional writers from all these other projects and shows that I admire their work and have them be like having deep conversations about the Briarwoods and you know their relationship with the Dorolos and, and then looking to me and going like, is that correct? And I'm like, kind of. And then I correct them, like, you know, like, um, actually, uh, they're not, they're originally from a wild map, but, uh, you know, the world, anyway, it's, it was very surreal to be in that room and be kind of like the story guy in front of all these, let me tell you, imposter syndrome's a bitch. Um, I'm waiting for the whole time for them to tell me to get out of the room, and I'm like, wait, no, I made this up! <laughs> um, so, anyway, super excited to show you guys that. It's gonna be an amazing show, even just the early designs, and I saw a scenic art piece of Whitestone with the sun tree in the center with like the bodies hanging, 
some of the art team and just, it's mind blowing. Ah, ah. <laughs> Can't wait to show you. <laughs> but anyway, nevertheless, uh, I guess raise your hand if you have no idea who I am or what Critical Role is. <laughs> so there, there is somebody, that's what I was hoping for. Because if so, I uh, welcome and I'm sorry. It's going to be a very confusing panel, but, um, but I'm glad you took the time. That's very sweet. You are outnumbered. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that's kind of the, the quick intro to just kind of get us up to speed with my own personal chaos right now and my excitement. And I want to make this a conversation now between us. So this is going to be, the rest of this panel is going to be a QA. and a I'm curious to hear what questions you have. Um, we have uh, Brittany right here with a microphone. Brittany Wallach, who is our amazing event director at Critical Role and also has given life to a number of puppets in the, uh, <laughs> the tra tra Travis Willingham's Yeehaw Game Ranch, one of the dumbest shows to have ever been produced, and yet we keep doing it, and it's amazing. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and make your way down to Brittany here. Line up carefully and respectfully, and we'll try and get through as many as I can with the time we have. If we start getting down to the wire, I'm, I'll turn this into a lightning round, in which case I'll have to request them be relatively easy to answer questions with a short answer, and if they aren't, you're gonna get a short answer, and that'll be funny anyway. Um, but, let us begin. Uh, tell me your name, by the way. Yeah, hi, I'm Matilda. Hello. I'm, this, I'm from Critical Role Translate. I'm the Swedish supervisor. <laughs> so, yeah, my question was to you. Have you ever done an audiobook, or have you ever considered or been offered to do one? I've actually done one audiobook. Oh. It was for a um, kind of loosely sci-fi th thriller with comedic elements called The Punch Escrow. That was the, it was a winner of uh, an Inky Award, I think, years ago. Actually, funnily enough, through Geek and Sundry contest. And uh, it got picked up for a film and everything. And I met the, the guy who wrote it, uh, Tal. He's a really, really sweet guy. And he specifically requested for me to do it because he was a fan of Critical Role. And I was like, yeah, OK. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun in the project. Um, audiobooks are difficult because they take a lot of time. <laughs> and a lot of it's just a time alone by yourself, talking into a void. <laughs> and the problem is when I get left in that void alone, my brain starts wandering to like world building and what the next <laughs> session has to be. So it becomes, a, that audiobooks is a difficult process for me to concentrate on. I enjoyed it, but I, it would have to be the right kind of book to probably inspire me to come back in and for that again. Doesn't mean it won't happen. It might happen, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. Um, Hello. Hi. <laughs> it's so surreal to actually have you respond. I'm right here. <laughs> <clears throat> what, I <laughs> um, what I've been wondering is um, com when you plan the campaigns, or just your anything really, do you write like multiple sessions ahead? Do you have like everything, the entire uh, arc, like written and like this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and then you change it? depending on the players, or do you just like write a bit of it and then wait for the players to do it and then you write the rest? That's a good question. I, uh, I, put, I try and create, I say multiple arcs, meaning I have a long form idea of where I might like the campaign to go. And when I say, a, when I say a, an outline, like it's very, very vague. Like for those who've seen campaign one, an example would be like, they begin as a party they might go to Westrun and they might find something out about Vecna. Then they, there's a Briarwood arc. I want to get to the Briarwood arc with Percy. Maybe that'll happen. Then the Conclave will happen and dragons will make things bad. They have to collect vestiges. And then maybe they'll defeat them. And then down the road, Vecna will come back. That's my outline for the campaign. Very simple and it's all liable to change because at any point, it might do something that radically alters the path that could have taken, in which case I'm like, all right, well, I lost three sentences. Big deal. Um, 
Then on a, on a smaller, more, more immediate scale, I'll prepare a little more fleshed out arc for maybe where there'll be a few sessions from now and try and like, try and seed that for myself. It's a little more detailed, a little more fleshed out, but not entirely because once again, all that can change rapidly based on what the players do and I don't want to like toss out six pages of hard written material. Uh, and then from there I plan session to session. I definitely want to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm not forced or trying to convince myself to shoehorn my players into my story that I worked on. Um, that, you know, it's fine if that's what you do and you don't have a lot of time to prepare and you're like, well, we kind of want to tell the story, that's okay, but I want to make sure the players feel like they're driving. And for me, the thrill of a dungeon master is not knowing what they're going to do and then having to adapt and change things for it. Sometimes they go on the path that I hope they go on and I'm like, yes. <laughs> not as often as you'd think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Hello. Hello. Ooh, this is crazy. Uh, do you have any other plans for like other media for Critical Role, like perhaps a game or uh, audio books or something like that? <laughs> I'd love to do like a video game. That'd be awesome. Um, audio books. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you know, bring it all full circle again. Like I started in cartoons and video games, and now we've made a cartoon. Why not make a video game? Um, however that'll look, I don't know, but we got a lot on our plate right now <laughs> with the series. But if the series does well, maybe, that, maybe that'll lead into something else. I would love to see that. I'd love to see like an RPG of some kind, story related. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be like, everyone plays Vox Machina. You know, that's, well, that, there's a fun aspect of that. I want, I want it to be like a new story in Taldori, you know, and maybe like they're out there. You know, the, the, old, the old retired heroes in the background. Uh, so, I don't know, fingers crossed maybe. As far as audiobooks go, there need to be a book first. <laughs> um, otherwise, it becomes an audio drama, which would be fun too. Uh, and I uh, and a few have asked me like, you should you should write a book. I'm like, well, I've I've done a campaign book. It's like no, like a novel. I'm like, I'm not a novel writer. There are some talented novelists out there, and if there's interest down the road, I am very happy for them to handle it. <laughs> I got enough on my plate right now. And then if there is a novel, sure, I'll do an audio book. Yep. So, yep. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Uh, my name's Astrid, and this uh, question is actually for my brother, who couldn't be here today. And he asked that, with you being a DM, is there an NPC concept you wanted to play as a player, or, is, or the other way around? And if, what, and if it is, what is it? Sorry, was that the second part of that question? <laughs> I'm getting a weird <laughs> echo up here, so I might come a little closer to you here. <laughs> as a DM, is there an NPC concept you've decided to play as a player, or vice versa, and what was it? An NPC concept? Yeah. Oh, NPC would I play, sorry. <sighs> the, I know, I'm jet lagged, I'm sorry, my brain's a little bit. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, NPC concept. Man, I, uh... I mean, Gilmore is a fun character. <laughs> he is. You know, Gil Gil Gilmore's, Gilmore's a, you know, like a lot of NPCs you create are kind of expressions of parts of yourself in some ways. That's why like Allura is very personal to me and Gilmore is very personal to me. They kind of represent elements of me kind of just fractured off and given life in other characters. So he'd be fun to play as. Okay. Uh, in the current campaign, I think it'd be fun to it'd be fun to step into the gentleman. Oh, because I mean, like, who doesn't want to have a crime syndicate at their hands as a player? Very accurate. That's pretty fun. <laughs> Though I must confess, I have not seen the second campaign. I am still in the first. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> but thanks for your answer. <laughs> no, no, thank you so much. That was a great question. Hi, uh, my name is Oscar, and Oscar. what I'm wondering is, uh, what made you pick Menagerie Coast as the secondary location? Was it because it was already pre-existing, 
or was it for another reason? For which location? The, uh, Men uh, the Menagerie Coast. Menagerie Coast, there we go. Uh, so the, the reason for them going to it? No, uh, having uh, like uh, the location uh, in the second campaign. Oh, oh, that, like, what was the inspire for, inspire for, yeah, inspiration yeah, for it? Yeah, what was the inspiration for it? Um, the Menagerie Coast, we, I had two, well, I was like, creating Wild Mount. You know, I had created like Port Damali and some locations loosely before the campaign began that I was like, there would be more of a coastal trade based, like a whole kind of culture that's very uh, similar to like a Caribbean type space. There's a bunch of islands and then a heavy coast area and a lot of port towns and a center for trade. And players begin, some of them begin to create backstories that really fit into this space. So I kind of had to flesh it out. But for me, the inspiration was very Caribbean uh, with elements of kind of the South Pacific, Pacific Islander, you know, culture elements there, as well as uh, kind of Moroccan and a lot of, a lot of that region as well. You know, it's, it's always like, it's, it's, it's trying not to, to take a culture and fit it in your world, but just like take the things that inspire you and then create based on what those pull out of your inspiration. So I think those would probably be the biggest inspirations for that area's creation. Um, and then add in there some healthy dose of pirates. Because <laughs> when you have a lot of sea trade and you have a lot of, uh, and, and it, people always say like, oh, pirates, they come with it. You want to have a reason for the pirates. Pirates didn't just pirate because they wanted to steal stuff. And if you look at it historically, the people that were pirates were originally, you know, merchant sailors and people that were just really unhappy with taxation and control over trade in those regions and their way of rebelling, much, you know, much like a mutiny on a ship, was to then start pirating. So that was kind of the inspiration for the Menagerie Coast's element of their, their pirate group. They're not just bad pirates that exist just because they're pirates. They have, they have a, a, a feud with the Clovis Concord that runs the Menagerie Coast and, and then it became a way of life. So anyway, world, bu world building dump there. <laughs> you tricked me into it. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Nefarian. Uh, in the new campaign, you seem a lot more prepared <laughs> sometimes. But <laughs> is there any time in the new campaign that you they threw you off the players, surprised you, or made you go, oh, wait? Hold on a second. I'm getting some weird echo up here, and it's hard for me to understand. Go ahead, Tim. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna do this with each question now. This okay. is gonna be fun. So get ready for some up close and personal interaction. <laughs> yeah, uh, in the new campaign, yeah. uh, has the players ever surprised you where you go like, oh, I haven't prepared this? Oh, yeah, many times, <laughs> many times. Uh, there is a, well, you all saw what happened in Nicodranas. Uh, when they decided to, to attack the ship and then <laughs> and then steal the ship <laughs> and then become pirates. <laughs> that w was not expected at all. Um, it's, there, there is a scary element of trust that comes to being a dungeon master and letting the players choose the direction of their campaign. And for, for that part, I didn't know where they were going to go. They, they had reached a point where they had finished the story arc in the middle of the, the Empire. And I was like, all right, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, let's go south. Let's go, to the, let's go to the shoreline of the coast. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, I'll put some story threads here and some things they could look for that might tie into some backstory elements or some meta narrative elements and be some fun way to, where are you guys going? <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. Well, there, okay, there's some people on a ship. Maybe they'll go ahead and like sneak up and try and eavesdrop. No, they're going right out there and they're. Okay, that's gonna piss that guy off. Uh, they're probably gonna try and run away and re no, they're gonna no, they're going all in. They're attacking the ship, <laughs> and now they're and now the guards are coming, and now they're they're gone. They're pirates. Okay. <laughs> so that. Thank you. You know, a lot of your job as a DM is trying to follow the logic thread of your players' choices and stay ahead of it. Um, that doesn't mean you succeed at it, but it's a lot of what you're trying to do. It's laying the track before the train type scenario. Um, so that's definitely a, a great example of that. Um, I think F Ford, I don't, don't want to spoil too much, Ford um, not fulfilling his pact with his, war, his warlock patron 
when they had the opportunity to. Like, I was fully expecting him to go all in and, like, complete the mission that was presented before him, and I had a whole thread of the campaign based on that choice, and he went, no, I'm just going to keep walking away. And I was like, <laughs> okay, all right. So that whole thread kind of died off, <laughs> but it meant that now the patron was going to get perpetually angrier and angrier, and now things have radically changed for Ford in recent episodes in ways I wasn't expecting, and so I, I love it. I love it. It's so exciting when players do weird stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, hi, uh, my name is Robin. Hello! Oh, okay. <laughs> hi, uh, yeah, my name is Robin, and I got a question about your little desert adventure about Burning Man. How did you start with it? When did you, like, how did you even hear about it? Because uh, I think I heard it first time from you in uh, one of your little talks on your channel on YouTube. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so. Give me the heads up here. Yeah, so. I've been going to Burning Man for 11 years. Oh. Uh, I it never thought it'd be my thing. And it isn't a lot of people's thing. It's hot, it's dusty, it's awful. It's in the middle of a dry lake bed that just wind and high alkali powder, palaya dust. Um, you have to live in a place that's trying to kill you for a week. Um, so why would you go there? The art's amazing, the, the people are incredible, it's a, it's a creative cultural experience that's unlike anything else I've been to. So for me, it's, it's like a creative reset, and, um, it's, and it also gets me off the grid for a week. And a world that's very connected, and a lot of my life and who I am is very public and very kind of open for good or, ver or worse, you know. I, I think definitely for the good of it, but there's also an element of being in the public eye that means a lot of negativity towards you, on the internet, and so it's nice to be able to go to the desert and just vanish for a week. Um, so yeah, th 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 there's a lot of th reasons it's important to me, and for a lot of friends and people that I care about, it's an opportunity that amongst our busy lives through the year to also reconnect away from the internet and computers and cell phones and just be people together. Yeah. Um, and that's really important. So if you're thinking of going, be prepared. It's rough. <laughs> Make no illusions, and it's not a week-long party. There'll be days that are hard. There are days where you have to kind of, you know, take, take a little bit of mental health breather and deal with your demons and what you're struggling with throughout the year, and it's very kind of a good crucible for that, too. So um, I, I, don't, you know, I don't like to evangelize it and be like, everybody should go. It's great. I'm going to be real about it. <laughs> a lot of it is unpleasant, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Hi. Hi. Ah, oh, uh, so we met earlier. Um, yes, we did. Yes, I'm Fisher, <laughs> and uh, I have a question about world building. Oh, okay. Yes, how do you organize all your law when you do world building? Okay. Because I sure am not. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've gotten better. I've gotten better. Um, I like this back and forth. It's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, f originally, for me, because. There are many great tools out there. I'll preface this. There are some amazing tools online that are great, like, uh, what's it called, like World Anvil? Uh, it's, there's some really, really great online utilities for world building and keeping all your notes organized. I am stuck in my old ancient ways and actually have it easier just doing it all in Word doc. Like, we're talking old, like, I've just used bullet points. So, like, I'll be like, all right, this is the name of the city. Big, bold, underlined, high, you know, bigger text. Like, I, I feel like I'm writing a report for school. <laughs> and then I'll, you know, italicize the name of a, of a district within a city. And then I'll write a paragraph about the general kind of culture of that part of the city. And then I'll bullet point locations in there, you know, like, for instance, with the Zadash, I'll have, like, the Penta Market. It would be a bullet point. And then I'll kind of do an inverted, like, I mean, fuller uh, bullet point beneath that, which are different shops in the Penta Market, and then I'll even go into a further bullet point in there that'll have the NPC that's at that particular shop with a little note about kind of their voice, you know, print that I want to remember, as well as note about their personality, and then even further bullet point in there if they happen to have information that's pertinent to a sort of story element or request. Um, Sounds like so, you've run out of page <sighs> to decide. It's a lot, it's, it's, there's so many better ways to do this than my way. <laughs> I'm not recommending my technique. Oh, I'm already um, using it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, I've, I've actually, I think I've posted on Twitter a few examples. I think I did a, a, a post of a Zadash story preparation so that you get to see the actual format there and the, the, the terrible layout of what, I, what all of my sessions are like, but that's what I'm used to and been doing for 20 years. So that's, that works great for me because I know the shorthand well and it's what I'm comfortable. I've tried other products. I've tried World Anvil and it was just like, Aah! Like, I understand why my grandparents can't use an iPhone. Like, that's, that's my version now. I'm uh, like, how does this thing, dang nabbit, does it work? That, that was me trying newer versions, but I'm just stuck in my old ways. Um, but as a general note, when it comes to world building, organizing wise, like, make sure your documents are on a cloud somewhere. <laughs> you know, a Dropbox. Oh Nothing's worse than losing hard, you know, built campaign setting elements when your hard drive fails. Back it up, put it somewhere. I've, I've had a friend of mine who was building his own homebrew campaign in, uh, uh, what was it? Traveler, which is a sci-fi RPG, is really good. And his hard drive failed and he lost like a year's worth of building work. Oh, no. So his name, was, his name was Caddy, Matt Caldwater. Do not be like Caddy. No. Back up your shit. Good question. That was <laughs> back ways, there you go. Actually, and, and to that point, like all the all the people we get, we get a lot of offers at the company now, which is still weird, of people wanting to advertise with Critical Role, and we we don't accept advertisers unless we can find some thread of use to us in our community, uh, even if they're fans of the show. And so, like Backblaze is one of those examples, exactly that. I'm like, yeah, maybe they're not directly D and D related, but man, some of us really need to have a way to back up these files. And I immediately thought of Caddy when when they offered, and I was like. Yeah, this will help somebody. <laughs> so, hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Hi. Um, I would like to ask you a question about cosplay, because I've been cosplaying for a very long time, awesome. and it has a special pl place in my heart. Well, also, best, one of the best Fallout 4 companions. Yes, I love Piper. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, you're a very talented DM, you're a talented uh, voice actor, but I know you've been cosplaying. Um, Long so time. My question is, um, what made you get into cosplay? Ah, good question. Yeah? Back onto the stage. So, I got... So, preface this, I love Halloween. <laughs> I love... Costume theme parties, always have since I was a kid. I've been playing dress up since I was very little, walking in my mom's room with her dresses and shoes on, you know. Like, always been just putting outfits on. Uh, so for me, it's, it's kind of been in the theatrical blood, I guess. And I was also a huge nerd. And so it was going way too, way, way too much time gluing, hot gluing cardboard to, to green t-shirts I'd cut out to make my reptile costume in fifth grade, you know, from Mortal Kombat and stuff. Um, and then I went to my first anime convention, which was Anime Expo in 1997, because I'm ancient compared to some of you people in this audience. <laughs> and there are some folks here who are more my age, and like, you feel me. <laughs> but I showed up there and saw, back then, like 20 cosplayers. And I was like, oh my god, people wear costumes outside of Halloween? Like, this is amazing! I have more reasons to do this. And so what got me into cosplay was realizing that I had another outlet and an excuse to make more costumes. And uh, so I, the next year for Anime Expo, I brought my Laguna costume from Final Fantasy VIII that I'd done for Halloween that year and just rewore it for the, for the convention and just met more people. And then I found the community. And that's what really inspired me was meeting other like-minded nerds that were so into the same stuff I was that they're like, I need to dress up like it for myself, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so like the hobby was great and then the people made me stay like uh, some of my best friends to this day I met through the cosplay scene Brittany who you see down here in the front I met her she used to run Southern California cosplay meetups down in like Orange County I just outed you girl <laughs> so like yeah the people that I still carry with me to this day as my closest friends are all people that I met being dressed up as nerdy Zelda characters, having, you know, drunken room parties with our wigs still on, you know? That's my, that's my, old, school, uh, my old school origins. <laughs> Love Good it. question. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, Matt. Hello. Uh, I'm Andreas. We met earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering whether you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just creepy. <laughs> yes? Uh, I believe you've told it before at a convention, but I would like to hear the story of how you and Marisha met. Oh, yes. Good question. Uh, we met originally through mutual friends. Uh, I did a web series years ago, years ago called There'll Be Brawl. That was, for those who don't know, super low budget, weird kind of film noir crime drama take on the Smash Brothers Nintendo universe. <laughs> All live action. And it was super silly. But one of my actress friends from that, uh, who also is a mutual friend of, of Brittany's, uh, Becky Young, was doing improv with Marisha, who had just moved out from Kentucky. And so we just met at a few events. I DM'd for her and her boyfriend at the time, so watch out for the DMs. <laughs> um, but we were just friends for years, and then uh, just loosely, like we'd meet up at different social events, and you know, it was always like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. And then about a year and a half later, I was out of a relationship for, after a long-term relationship, and was just kind of like not wanting to, to date. The dating scene was dangerous. <laughs> not great for you know, a, a nerdy indoor kid like me. And she was in the process of uh, getting out of her long-term relationship, and we just got together and got drinks, and we're like, you're cool. We should hang out more. Oh, you're still in a relationship. Ah, oh, well. And she called me next week and was like, yeah, I'm, I got out of that relationship. I'm like, we should get drinks. <laughs> Thank you for that. No worries. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I won't be as creepy with my pr oh, no, approach this time. It's totally fine. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, when building the world of Exandria and the people and places there, what would you say are the most, like, the biggest inspirations, films, TV, books that, like, inspire and give you ideas, what, like, what you pull from? Ah, oh, good question, actually. It's, funnily enough, it's less, it's less movies that inspire me or stories, it's art. Like, sometimes I'll, I'll go through art books that are just collections of different pieces and Images, whether it be characterizations and emotion or locations there will, will inspire me uh, and just go from there. A friend of mine, Dan Norton, who was uh, the art director on the, Th the Thundercats reboot I was in back in like 2011, uh, may, may rest its soul, um, he just does this incredible art of just weird locations that he comes up with and his just um, imagination goes once wild on it. He'll just post them on Facebook every now and then. And I began to realize that he'd post a piece of art, and I'd be like, oh, that's such a cool-looking piece of art. That, what would the lore around that be? <laughs> and I would start building out the kind of where that would fit in a world and what mysteries might lie in the middle of that art piece. And all of a sudden, I've unexpectedly built a location that might fit within Exandria. And so, for me, art, art's always been a huge inspiration. I, I train in art, I was an art kid growing up. I was planning to become an illustrator before I realized that I couldn't cut it as an illustrator. And uh, to me, there's something about a, a silent, still image that invites you to fill in the blanks and kind of build around it that ends up being a perpetual point of inspiration, which I think is part of the reason why I love the art community around Critical Role so much too, is they inspire me as much as, you know, I hope to inspire them. But thank you. Hi there, you beautiful human being. <laughs> Hi, my name's Nick from Copenhagen. Nice to be here. To All right, so I have a question about Orly, favorite turtle. So his tattoo magic. I would like if you could explain a little bit about, more about that when it comes to the somatics, the ingredients, how it's applied, how the spell work works, what a magical circle it's from, that kind of stuff. Kind of because the way Liam uses his component pouch has really kind of awakened me when it comes to role play, like applying spells to stuff when I play. Yeah. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about Orly and his tattoo magic with All right. gemstones. Okay, so Orly was an NPC I didn't create. I know, we know. Orly was an NPC you all created. 
I see you all trying to, trying to kick my legs out from under me. <laughs> yeah, Tortle Bart, have fun with that, Mercer. <laughs> He's got a stutter. Ha, you forget, I had a stutter, so <laughs> technically still have. So, ha, I got you there, too. So, um, for him, the, the tattoo magic came part of that design, which is another thing you guys chose. I began to think, you know, the creation of, of inks and pigments. There's so many different places you could pull pigment, and a lot of things that are often enchanted are gems, you know. Imagine if you were to crush gems to such a fine degree that perhaps they could be utilized as a form of pigment, uh, whether it be placing them close enough to the skin that this, they scab over and it remains inside, you know, if you want to get to the more gruesome details of it. Um, but then as a bard also, the ability to, to weave magic kind of instinctually through them, I like the idea of him being able to ritualistically as part of placing this tattoo on somebody, weave his own magic into it, and uh, imagine like, a, like a, a, a turtle sitting there kind of gently humming to himself through his built-in bagpipes, and as he places each of these little granules of crushed gem beneath the skin with his strange tattoo device that he's had custom tinkered for him, probably from somebody in Hupperduke for way too much money, <laughs> um, that you see like each of these beads kind of flash and glow as he places and draws the design in. And as it does, he just thinks of, uh, you know, what, what this person wants to. Is it their strength? Is it their guile? Is it whatever it may be? And I just wanted a cool alternate option for the players to like possibly one time give himself an attribute buff. But then they also didn't return to the Menagerie Coast and, uh, and they sent him away on their ship, the Ball Eater. <laughs> Which for the record, Anytime you want, you're going to spend a decent amount of money having some amazing artist custom create a great set piece for your players that you think is going to be a central part of their campaign for a while, they're going to give it the dumbest name they possibly can. I was like, all right, guys, you have the opportunity here to name your own pirate ship. This is, like, nobody gets this opportunity. Like, what are you going to name it? Ball Eater. Okay, cool. This is... <laughs> On brand, why was I, why did I ever expect it to be anything else? That's on me. <laughs> yeah, where is... <laughs> okay, so... Okay, so... Uh, yes. Uh, air, air, air's kind of ringing after all the clapping, but, but uh, the important... Uh, the question was... Uh, uh, so I remember Critical Role used to play uh, Pathfinder before yeah. the before fifth edition came out, mm -hmm. and uh, I was wondering what your first impressions on the second edition of Pathfinder are. Ooh, good question. <laughs> so I had the opportunity to check through the uh, the second edition of Pathfinder after Gen Con this summer, and uh, I think it's a huge improvement to Pathfinder. Um, I love Pathfinder and played it for many years, just like I played 3.5 and third edition through m most of my post high school years. Um, the things I disliked about some of those additions was, unless your party was a very small size, combat can get unwieldy. There's a lot of kind of floating modifiers that go around, and it becomes easy for you to be pulled out of the moment because you're trying to keep track of all these different elements of, of overlapping effects and class abilities that it, it's just this woven chaotic rainbow of, ah! So they've definitely helped mitigate a lot of that in the current edition. I think they've also helped wean off of some of the, uh, the unfortunate tropes that linger from older editions of role-playing games and such, you know, moving away from you know, race elements more to lineage. And there's a lot of like, cool uh, choices that are being made to try and course correct some of the things that aren't as necessary uh, anymore in the way these games are designed. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely a step in that direction. I haven't played it yet, so I don't know if the system runs akin to like a fifth edition for my, my taste as far as expediency and, and keeping the, the, the drive of, of narrative stuff, because I've only been able to read through it in a theoretical sense. But I like a lot of the changes they've made. I like how they've uh, you know, kept the possibility of crunchy character creation that made Pathfinder so distinct from like fifth edition D&D. You know, if, if they went too hard and swung too hard in that direction and just tried to do another side version of 5th edition, that would have been a very disappointing thing because they would have, you know, essentially kicked off the people who were still playing Pathfinder for that particular reason and then just presented another option for what was already existing and well-adopted system. So I think it was a really good move for them. I look forward to playing it and trying it out and I could probably give you a better 
a better, more tested uh, opinion on it. But so far, I think second edition Pathfinder is actually a, a really, really good step in the right direction for him. So, good question. Hi, Matt. My name's Alma. Yes, hello. Hey. Uh, I have a question about Essek. Uh, ah. So this might be a minor spoiler, depending on your answer. Uh, but by now we know that he floats instead of walking. And that got me thinking if that is for a reason or not. Is it so that Essek can't walk by an accident or otherwise? I've heard that question come asked a few times. Um, Essek is a, what I call a, a graviturgist, which is a person who specifically focuses in Dunamancy's study of gravity. So uh, while, while Dunamis hits very elements of time manipulation, space manipulation, uh, gravity and density is a big part of that study as well. Um, so for him, I think it's, it's less of an accident. Um, there's always a, a, a challenge too. And to that point, when I begin hearing people ask that question, I'm like, oh man, that'd be really cool to have that. You know, uh, rep an element of that, but I also have my own reasons for having it, uh, you know, something that he does because he's just kind of a little arrogant with his, his ability set, and he just, he wants to be like, I don't have to walk. <laughs> you guys can go ahead and use your feet. Me, I choose not to. <laughs> so that, that's kind of the idea behind it. Like, he could use his feet, and on occasion when nobody's looking, he'll probably walk around his home, you know? But when anybody's around to look, he's like, eh, fuck all y'all. <laughs> Just hover around. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Robert. Hey, Robert. Good to see you. Uh, first off, thank you for coming here. It's a, you're a huge inspiration for me. Cool. Professionally, I'm starting education, later actor and uh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, my question is, uh, what's the most challenging or fun character in voiceover that you have done, not critical role? Ooh, most challenging. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Their challenging can be taken different ways. Um, there's a project I'm working on right now that's challenging because the director keeps directing me to not act, and that drives me nuts. <laughs> it's one of those, like, that's good, even less, even less. You do the performance, so even less, even want to be super realistic, very cinematic, even less, to the point where the reads like, all right, we're going this way. <laughs> we're under fire, we have to go now. He's like, perfect. I'm like, that's awful. He's like, no, it's great, keep going. I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> so that's challenging for me mentally. Um, I think for me, there, there are different ways. There's challenge meaning like it's a, it's a delicious character that I want to bring to life, and then there's challenges and like actually physically taxing on me. I love the Shadow of Mordor, Shadow of War series. It's so much fun. Uh, as a, growing up a huge Tolkien nerd, being able to step into the role of the Witch King of Angmar in Shadow of War was an incredible honor. But in both those games, I played a shit ton of orcs. You can hear me all throughout there. Probably like a fourth of the orcs you killed in those games are me. <laughs> and that's fun. But it's all facial motion captured. And it's all, each game, I'd say at least 12 to 16 four-hour sessions. And they're four hours at a time of performing these orcs. And because the baseline of these orcs is like kind of shouty, is their conversation going as loud as like screaming to the top of a fortress for four hours. <laughs> Not like you get a break every five minutes. We're talking an hour or two straight of going, you stupid talk! Come down here and I'll eat your face off! <laughs> Thank you. That's fun for me for 10 minutes. <laughs> By the fourth hour, you're tasting the iron flavor of blood in the back of your throat, and you have to take a day or two off of not talking, or you're going to permanently destroy your voice in some way. So like, those are the most challenging roles. They can be wonderful, but it's a challenge. Good question. All right. So, here's the deal. 
We only have about five more minutes for this panel, but I want to get to all of your questions. So this is going to be a lightning round. Keep your questions succinct and expect a very succinct answer. But I'll do my best to get it to you. So, all right, first up, what's your question? Hi, um, my question is, uh, if you would uh, cosplay someone from Vox Machina or Mighty Nine, who would it be? Oh, Molly Mock. Good question. <laughs> Pass it on over here. What's your question? You can do this. <laughs> Holy shit, you're here. Uh, Holy shit, what's your question? Yeah. Um, fuck, um, how, <laughs> sorry. It's all good. Um, so my name's Daniel, uh, and could you just give a really brief rundown on how you design new magic? Because I'm reworking the old magic system, which is a lot, but like just very quick. Very quick. Magic's cool, magic's missing some things. I like physics. I like astro and quantum physics. Didn't have astro physics, astro physics magic spells. I made them. <laughs> you find the gap, you fill the gap. Good question. Hi. Um, why did you start voice acting? Why did I start? Because I'm a huge nerd who likes video games and cartoons. And then I got into theater and became a huge theater nerd. And then one day I went, I can fold these two together. <laughs> That's why. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. What's your um, what is Vax doing now with the Raven Queen in the Void? Ooh, good question. Vax is, as the champion, wearing a Raven mask and basically being her little errand boy for all of eternity. <laughs> Thank you. But, but before you go, oh, that's really sad. Also, gets to be like her companion, where she's been super lonely for a long time too. So. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Hello, what's your question? Uh, pleasure meeting you. Uh, Gustav, and um, D&D has given you the ability to interact with a lot of celebrities. Who's the top three you haven't DM for yet? Oh, uh, man, good question. Stephen Colbert's off the list now, so that's crazy. Uh, so I'm going to say Stephen Colbert again. <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda. And just because of... It would be really funny, given a long story that I had that I won't tell this panel, Angelina Jolie. Because <laughs> technically I met her when I was six months old. But that's a story for another panel. Hello. Hey. Uh, who is another DM that inspires you? Uh, well, uh, still, if you look at the shirt of the last question there, uh, Matthew Kilville is a very inspiring Dungeon Master and a huge friend of mine. Deborah Ann Wall is incredible. If you haven't checked out Rarex Rarex and... Relity, uh, Rarex and, and, and Rarities, or seeing her Dungeon Master uh, at many of the D&D live streams. She's an amazing Dungeon Master and a huge inspiration, too. Um, and actually, if you've seen uh, Marisha on our channel, she's brilliant. Um, and I'm excited to see Ashley finally DM some point soon. And I'm sure she will be as well. Good question. Hi. You look awesome! Thanks. What's your question? <laughs> so, uh, I'm stacking up some exhaustion points from Frenzied Raging. Fair enough. So. How do you deal with burnouts? Except for Burning Man. Good question. Uh, walk away for a bit. I find that if you're burning out and forcing yourself to work, that's just going to make it more and more of, of a hard process. Walk away. Go on a hike. Listen to some nice music. Reconnect with the nature. Um, and, do n and, and if it's your worry about letting your players down, communicate to your players you need a break. And if your players in a campaign and your DMs been working really hard to tell the story for you for a long time, and they tell you they need a break, do not give them a hard time. Understand that, that there's a lot of pressure there. Let them take a break and maybe offer to DM for them. Good question. Hi. Hello, what's your question? Uh, would you want to do another Grog one-shot where you're playing Alora or Gilmore? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I would. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Any chance I had to return to any of those two make me happy, so the answer is yes. <laughs> right, oh, my. Hello. Oh my. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> so my. My question is this, Matthew. Okay. Uh, if if uh, I have a campaign at home and Vax Ildan is an exarch of the Raven Queen and my players manage to summon him somehow, what does he do? <laughs> what does he do? Uh, well, it depends. Who are the prettiest members of your party? <laughs> <laughs> That's a half orc, actually. Well, well, you know, he spends a lot of time on his own, so he might flirt a little bit. Um, 
No, I I'd say he'd be interested in in seeing her will be done, and uh, how will he kick ass if he's summoned at enemies? What was that? If he's summoned by at enemies, how will so he kick ass? enemies? How will he kick oh, ass? Oh oh oh! Well, you've seen him. He's a he's a fucking bullet with wings and blades. Will he dagger dagger he's dagger? This moving serrated dagger barrage. Dagger dagger. dagger. Like, it, it, it's totally Dragon Ball Z style. Like, Thank you very much. And everyone just falls into pieces. Thank so, you, yeah, Matthew. Go with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Okay, this is surreal. One. Yes. Thank you for being here. Oh, Two, thank you for having me. Are you ever going to create Dagon as an NPC? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly Ira Cockra. Maybe. I love my bird. My bird's also sometimes capable of being a real bitch, um, based on the numerous scars on my hands, <laughs> and sometimes my face. She likes to bite my face for no reason. Birds. Uh, <laughs> she loves Marisha. We're cool. <laughs> Most of the time. Uh, so yeah, Dangon would probably be an enemy. <laughs> no worries, good question. Hi, my name hey. is Blaze. I'm actually an American just like you. Awesome. Uh, I'm starting Curse of Straw tomorrow as the DM. So I nice. uh, don't have any more time for a question. Just want to say thank you for the inspiration. And uh, yeah, that's all. Thank oh, you. Thank you. That's awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Hi. <laughs> um, here, here's yes. the die. Um, oh, oh right, thank it. you. That will determine your question. Oh, we should roll it? Roll. Ah! One. One! Okay. <laughs> then my question is, you know that picture of you on the merry-go-round where you're just like this? <laughs> yep. What is the context? I've seen it so many times. What is the context? Do you really want context? Yes. <laughs> but isn't it so much more fun if you don't have it? Please, please, this will be a Fine, fine, joke. fine, I'll give you context. This will be a Swedish inside joke. There you go. Quick context. Uh, years ago, a friend of, of mine and my girlfriend at the time was a photographer who had been hired to film a safety video for a little carnival that was like in middle California. So I was like, a, you know, do this, don't do this. Keep your hands inside, you know, the cart. Don't, don't, you know, put them in the machinery. It was like, it was a little video. And we wanted to shoot it like an old timey 1920s black and white. And so she dressed up as like the good example, which was like a little like white clown with like little white face makeup and stuff and little hearts and the little like clown kid that matched her. And I was like the evil dastardly guy that did all the things you're not supposed to in the video. And that was the outfit that I wore for the thing. And because we finished early, I was like, let's just take some random photos. And so I started just getting real creepy and like standing on different things going, nah. And that's what that picture's from. It was actually at the carnival on the, the, the kind of merry-go-round looking creepy. There you go. Thank you. Good question. You look awesome. I love it. We're good? Ah, <laughs> we did it. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you for talking silly stories. You're all amazing. And uh, enjoy the rest of your convention here in Stockholm. Thank you for having me. I love you.